welcome everybody uh, to this uh, virtual seminar being given by our derek um it's uh, i want to give a little bit of introduction i known derek for a, a long it feels like a long long time for me anyhow uh, maybe not as long for derek um uh, he used to come and ask these really difficult questions at the end of my lectures in the third year and that continued in the fourth year and it was always a little bit uh, you know after the lecture is done you just want to get back get yourself a cup of tea and get prepared for what you are doing whereas derek could hold me up for about uh, maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes and would go through the lectures and it, it always would feel ah is he trying to pull my leg here or uh, is it like a genuine curiosity and now i can say having known direct for a much longer period as a phd student uh, it's genuine curiosity he's a really curious bloke and that's a really good attribute to have in a phd student um when derek was doing his first year in the cdt scheme the amresia Uh, we happened to come across a very interesting problem. Uh, Tony O'Brien, Yu Sheng Su, and Sergio Solera came along, and they said this: uh, we have this issue with these uh, deep basement structures. We, uh, we are being asked to design and construct, and they had uh, four or five of them at the time, and now there are even more of these uh, deep basements being constructed in London as we speak. And the difficulty is this: that when you excavate the soil. uh it obviously you're removing the vertical stress up to the level of excavation and therefore the uh, the soil would naturally want to swell swell up and if you put a structure in its place and stop the swelling it wants to apply larger and larger forces now if you don't have a good understanding and if you make some uh, um assumption about the swell pressure you can end up designing with very very thick basement in fact you think you once said to me that these uh, slabs are so thick and so heavily reinforced that it's really getting hard to get the concrete in between the reinforcement is that uh, how heavily these things are being uh, reinforced and that's because people are worried about how much well pressure will come on to the slab so this problem came up exactly as derek was searching for a, a suitable phd topic and and uh, the curious blurb that he is he said yeah this is the one i want to try and uh, solve during my phd mm-hmm. here we are about 3 3 and a half years maybe from that point uh, yeah. the first few months anyhow uh, here is the fruit of all his labor and without taking too much of your time and uh, giving the game away i let uh, derek um, give his presentation a very very warm welcome to you derek and look forward to uh, seeing it all put together in a nice way thank you gopal um thank you for the introduction so that was um professor madabushi um who is my supervisor and i'd like to add to the welcome to all of you and also thank you to um gopal and our administrator magda for giving me this opportunity to turn this season of physical isolation into a chance to make my end of project presentation an international affair so um thank you for all of you who have, who are joining us today from um, from cambridge from other parts of the uk i know some of you are dialing in from central europe and some of you are dialing from hong kong and singapore so thank you so much everybody for coming regardless of your time zones and so in today's story our first introduce the problem and um i'll give us a very introductory understanding of the phenomenon of basement heave what it is and why it happens and then i'll introduce how we try to solve the problem using what is essentially a time machine and with that we discerned the self fulfilling prophecy of heavy heave displacements and pressures that gopal was talking about just now and then finally i'll take us back to the real world to see what we can do to connect our experimental and computational investigations to real life construction problems 
by proposing improvements to the way we design basements. So here is where I'm going to start. I'll give us a rudimentary introduction to our first world problem. So for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Derek. And this slide, the picture here, is where I grew up. This is a residential area in Hong Kong called Lantin. Um, those of you who live in Hong Kong already know this um, from your Hong Kong geography. Those of you who have visited Hong Kong, particularly um, civil engineers, will likely know this as the place, as the piece of rocky land that sits between the Victoria Harbor and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And if you know it a bit better, uh, Lamtin is the northern exit to the Eastern Harbor Tunnel. So this is where I grew up. It looks like a bunch of standard Asian looking residential towers, but underneath it is a whole underground world. Where I was standing as I took this picture, was actually on a granite outcrop that was actually a disused landfill from a few decades ago. People put a lining on top and rehabilitated a land into a baseball field. And then right next to it, there's a sharp drop into a natural valley where there is now a railway station that is partially submerged into the rock and partially sticking out into the air. And then there is an eight lane motorway followed by a bus terminus and a shopping mall. And then the hill gradually slopes up to give more residential towers. And then eventually a country park that rose down gently to the other district on the other side of the hill where UST is. So what I really want to say is complex underground spaces are my native language. I grew up going downstairs to take a train or a bus just about wherever I, I needed to go. That's how I lived the first decade and a half of my life. And, and so this is my basic understanding of how underground spaces work. And so as introduced earlier, when this problem of underground spaces in London requiring a lot of heavy structures um, to construct, I, I became interested straight away because the kind of urban underground space construction problem is the kind of things that I've been in interested in since a very young age. And so the problem here is that unlike the granite in Hong Kong, the clay in London does something slightly different. As you can see from this research brief that Yusheng put to us this time four years ago, after we build a railway station, we get this somewhat curious behavior where the bottom part of the basement wants to curve upwards because the clay is trying to push it out of the ground. So why does this happen? Well, let's start by looking at this fundamentally from how clay behaves. Um, many of you are used to solid objects in real life. And um, those of us who like building sand castles on the beach, we we'll know that soil and all types of it are granular materials. So we have little grains of sand or clay that are stuck together in a somewhat irregular pattern. And between the grains, there is space that is filled of e either air or water. And when you try to compress a sample of soil, it wants to compress like a solid and then bounce back, not quite like a solid. When it bounces back, it doesn't go back to where it started like it would if you just pushed a, a, a piece of foam or, or a spring. Instead, it tries to compress permanently and then bounce back a lesser amount. And just to make it more complicated, this is not on a linear scale. The volume I've plotted here is on a linear scale, but the pressure I'm plotting here is on a logarithmic scale. And so we get this behavior that is neither completely reversible, although partially reversible, and it's not linear in terms of its magnitude. And when we do construction in clay 
um, particularly stiff clay like the ones we find in London and Cambridge, we get an extra problem, which is the pores between the grains of clay are very small. And so when you compress the sample of clay, you're actually pushing the water out of the box. And that takes time. And because this is a problem driven by pressure changes, the movement is not linear either. And as you can see on this plot of movement versus the square root of time, the first thing I notice is there's actually a square root of time, not linear time. And the behavior begins with a linear portion in square root. So it actually scales with the square root of time and then exponentially decays to your final outcome. So we've got this phenomenon that is nonlinear in both space and time. And that's why any approach to this would necessarily be quite complex. But at the same time, we need to simplify the problem down to a level that we can use in routine design so that we can actually build some basements and not become completely tied up with the minutiae of how individual grains of, of, of sand and clay behave. And so a number of methods are used in industry to design basements. At the very rudimentary level, the problem of basement construction involves taking soil out of the ground and then putting in a structure. And so we can theoretically prevent any significant movement by making sure that our new structure can provide as much force as the soil that we've removed used to provide in terms of force. That's a very conservative approach and it works, which is why this problem hasn't been researched particularly significantly until the 21st century, because there is a super conservative method that 100% works, it's just expensive and, and, and uneconomical. So to introduce some complexity into that, we can first assume everything is linear elastic. We can ascribe a Young's modulus to all the materials, including um, the soil elements and the structure elements to the problem and, and get some prediction out of it. But as we saw in the previous slide, soil behavior is nonlinear in both space and time. So I want to put some of that data in. And so um, a number of simplified nonlinear methods have been developed in industry over the years to analyze this problem and put in some of that detail. And on the most complex end, of course, we can perform advanced finite element analysis that aims to, to capture all the details in the problem that we are able to model. But regardless of the complexity of the problem, we need physical data to understand it further, verify the methods and calibrate the parameters. And so we started looking at what case studies there may be available um, for us to have real data from real construction projects to calibrate our methods of investigation. And there is a very prominent case in Westminster where because of a change in, in planning regulations, the basement was constructed with an anticipation for a 10 story building on top, but a 10 story building didn't get built for the next 21 years. And in this time, engineers were allowed to monitor how the basement naturally moved as the clay continue to move in response to that construction 21 years ago. Interestingly, we saw from here that this curve is quite similar to the clay sample compression curve that we saw um, a few slides ago. So one of the lessons we took from this is, this is a proper clay consolidation problem that we can investigate using the same methods as we would do any other um, clay compression and swelling problems, despite the fact that this is a truly three-dimensional issue. The time dependency of it seems to follow the same pattern. And so to summarize what basement heave is, it arises from the fact that we have dug out natural soil from a space to create the underground space for people to inhabit. But in that process, because Every material um, in the universe is a bit of a sponge. 
it wants to swell in response to your removal of the top over burden. And so the saw wants to expand, but that expansion takes in, in some cases more than 20 years to happen. And so we really lack physical data to calibrate and verify any method we are using in industry to design for this problem. And so the obvious question is, a PhD cannot be more than four years long. How do we improve upon this within four years of research? And the obvious answer is, please give me a time machine. And as it turns out, we do have a time machine. In civil engineering, um, a lot of physical phenomena are fundamentally driven by gravity. And if we can increase gravity, we can study the same problems with a smaller model and a smaller time scale. And that is what geotechnical centrifuge modeling is. In West Cambridge, we have um, the UK's largest centrifuge is 10 meters across. And we routinely use this to, to make experimental models that are performed at 100 times Earth's gravity. And the dimension similarity works out so that if you perform an experiment that is one in a hundred the size of your real life construction problem at a hundred times Earth's gravity, you will get the same behavior as the real life problem, but with the added benefit that time passes in your experiment as if it is 10,000 times as quickly as real life. And those of you who know your rules of thumb in maths might know that 1, 000, uh, 10,000 hours is about the same as a year. And so we are now simulating a year's worth of real life problem in each hour of construction. And so we can shorten that real life deformation problem into something that we can simulate in the lab within a day. here so that we can isolate the heave problem from the flotation problem. On top of that, we've got dry is similar to there not being a basement because this space is filled up with something. This space is filled up with something that is the same density as outside. Uh, there, During the experiment. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? I think uh, we lost you for a, a few minutes. So, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll restart from here. Yeah. yeah. So, so in civil engineering, we do have something that behaves like a time machine. Many civil engineering physical phenomena are driven by gravity. And so in West Cambridge, we have the UK's largest centrifuge. What this does is that this 10 meter wide device allows us to perform experiments at 100 times Earth's gravity. And when we perform a one in a hundred scale model experiment at a hundred times Earth's gravity, the time scaling works out such that it passes inside the experiment 10,000 times as quickly as outside the experiment. The, the soil and structural elements behave like time is passing that much faster. And um, some of you might notice that 10,000 hours is about a year. And so what this means is that in each hour of lab simulation, we are able to reproduce a year's worth of real life construction phenomena. And, and so we can shorten that multi-year long period of movement in real life into something we can simulate in the lab within a day. And this is how um, we further simplify the problem into our experimental package. So we have a 16 meter thick clay layer, which is 160 millimeters. Uh, 
in model scale. And this layer um, is, is um, saturated clay. On top of it, we have dry sand so that we can set the water table at this boundary and isolate the flotation problem away from the excavation and heave problem. We have a basement model. And at the start of the experiment, we fill the model with a fluid that is the same density as the sand outside so that it will behave as if there was no basement to start with. During the experiment, we use a series of pipes to empty out that fluid to create the excavation effect. And then we have a lid that pushes the basement downwards with some load on top to simulate the effect of building a, um, an extra structure on top of your basement after we finish um, building the basement. So this is how we prepare each experimental model. We start with clay powder, put it into an industrial bread mixer and add water to turn it into a, a gooey slurry. And then we compress it inside a hydraulic frame to get the clay to the consistency we want. We install some instrumentation into the clay and then remove it from the press and trim it to a desired thickness. In the meantime, we prepare the structural model. This is the first model we used in the experimental series. It has a lid to give it extra weight. And we then put the model onto the clay, put the plumbing in um, for the excavation simulation. And then we use an automatic robot to pour dry sand on top of the clay layer to create our complete experimental setup, which we put into the centrifuge. So as you can see, our technicians' fingers for size, this is about one meter across, and there is about nine meters of equipment behind where I was taking this photo, which is the rest of the centrifuge. So we set this all up about this time three years ago. Everything was ready to go on a hot summer day, and then it was leaky. And by the way, the box didn't do very much when we emptied it out anyway. So what can we do? Okay, the big problem was that in our experiment, we tried to use a bolter structure so that we could add a hinge or unbolt it afterwards. Maybe that was a bad idea. So the first thing I did was just make it not leaky by wording all of it. And the second issue is that um, it was too stiff. The first structure we tested tried to match a real life basement and that was quite stiff. So let's start from a hypothetical problem that has the same physical phenomenon. Let's just make it really flexible. So we make the next basement out of a very thin sheet of brass. And while we're there, we added some strain gauges so we could measure the bending curvature on the basement box as we did the experiment. We also did a proof test with only dry sand and no clay to check that all the plumbing was working and the basement box itself was not leaky before we did the next round of simulations. But while we were there, we also added extra instrumentation in addition to strain gauges. We introduced these sheets, um, the brand name is called TechScan, and what they are is that they are tactile sensing mats. So, They've got these, you can see these vertical and horizontal lines. They are lines of pressure sensitive ink that change resistance as you increase the compression between the two sides of the sheet. And you can see a sheet is quite compliant. So we can wrap it around the basement structure um, to give us a distributed measurement of pressure. And we calibrate these things by putting it under a known load in the same um, compressive hydraulic jack that we talked about earlier. And we also added the, this thing is, an, is a 1D actuator, which allows us to apply a load on top of the basement during the experiment. What it does is that it allows sequential construction to be simulated in the experiment. We first empty out the box and then put a load on top. Also, we added a cone penetrometer because why not we still have space? What this allows us to do is to test the strength of the clay during the experiment so that we can compare the results to 
real life construction problems, for example, in London and Cambridge. So let's look at some experimental results here. I'm comparing two experiments that both used this flexible model, but one had a very light load on top, only about two or three stories worth of building. And the other one had a heavy load on top after activation, simulating about 10 stories of building. So in each experiment, we turn on a centrifuge, increase the gravity, so that leads to some settlement. And then the clay needs to consolidate to its own equilibrium and that takes a few hours in experimental time, equivalent to about 100 months in um, real life equivalent time. And then we perform the excavation, which leads to some instantaneous swelling, followed by some more swelling after we put the load on and finish the construction. And then we watch the basement gradually heave to its new equilibrium. When we look at the zoom in of this data, quite curiously, we see that the two models seem to behave quite similarly. The middle of the slab seems to have moved up about the same amount, regardless of how much extra load you put onto the wall after you excavate a basement. And that's something we'll come back to again later. Earlier, we said we had a cone penetrometer to measure clay behavior. So we can plot some graphs about that we see that the stiffness, uh, sorry, the, the strength of the clay during the centrifuge test is about 100 kPa, quite consistent with predictions by um, critical state theory and also somewhat similar to real life stiff, um, strengths that we get from London clay. And we can also use the clay preparation process to get some data about the compression and swelling behavior of the clay. And we have observed that, um, as with many previous experiments, that even on a log axis, the swelling isn't linear. And this is something that one might want to build into a design method so that we can capture the varying um, swelling capacity of the clay as it, as it swells more and more. And we said we had these tactile sensing mats to measure the contact pressure between the basement slab and the soil underneath. So we can visualize some of that data. Before excavation, unsurprisingly, we have a larger uniform distribution of stress. Once we excavate and construct, we get this interesting behavior where the middle of the basement essentially sees no load and all the load is concentrated on the edges. And as the clay consolidates, that clay pushes on the basement by spreading the load from sides to the middle. And we can see that on a graph of pressure versus position um, on the axes as well. So the sides see more pressure, the middle essentially sees no force even at long-term equilibrium. And again, we see this curious effect where the load on the side essentially makes no difference to what happens in the middle. The two models have very different loads on the ends, but in the middle, they both see no load because of the basement is so flexible in this case. We can also compare the experimental data with site data from that 21 years of monitoring we talked about earlier. And quite happily, we see that um, even when we plot on a linear axis of vertical movement, the results matched up quite well, and it confirms that our experiment was able to reproduce the real life phenomenon of long-term basement heave. And we can use that data um, to understand the mechanisms further. So just to sum up um, what we learned from these flexible basements, um, our centrifuge model has successfully given us simultaneous measurements of displacements and pressures. And we saw a good agreement between the site data and our centrifuge data. And our comparison between two different flexible construction models have shown us that if our flexible slab is flexible enough, it can decouple the heave problem from the oversight load problem that would push onto the top of the basement. So that might be a strategy that um, one can use in a real life construction scenario. So um, that is, 
the introduction to the experimental method and some of the first results. Now I'll tackle this problem of self-fulfilling prophecies head on. Like what is the issue that we're trying to refine in industry using our predictions? Well, currently, if we want to do better than assuming 100% overburden coming up as heave load, but we also want to do something less complicated than an advanced finite element model, there are some rules of thumb that are being used in industry. Many assume that above 50 to 65% of the original weight of the soil above the basement will turn up as a long-term heave, heave pressure after you build a basement and let the clay reach a new equilibrium. So that's a rule of thumb that is very well grounded in theory, but it is a rule of thumb nonetheless. If you want a more detailed analysis, then we can use this method called the relaxation ratio method. And what it involves is similar to the compression confinement method for those of you who have done tunneling. We plot displacement on one axis and we plot some measure of pressure on the other axis. And we plot a nonlinear curve that represents a soil behavior on these axis and superpose various curves representing the structural elements on top of that. And so intuitively, where the two sets of curves cross by the idea of simultaneous equations is your estimate of displacement and pressure. So this is commonly used in industry. And in the next few slides, I'll show that this assumption of 50 to 65% overburden is correct, but self-fulfilling. And that the relaxation ratio method is good enough, although we can refine it slightly. So to make that investigation, we need to be able to, re, um, to adjust the stiffness of the basement model. So we created another one, which is made of stainless steel, is about three times as thick as the previous one. And so it's actually about 300 times as stiff in terms of, um, in terms of stress and strain units. And it's fully welded again to um, prevent any leakage. The stiffness of this box is actually made to match a typical basement in London clay that has about one meter thick walls and one meter thick um, concrete basement slabs. So um, we also performed finite element simulations using the small strain hardening model to represent the clay. This model is good for stiff clays like London clay because the hardening behavior, which captures, which captures the um, behavior of the clay as it approaches collapse. And finally, it uses those two elements to capture the volumetric behavior of the soil. And um, when we perform that simulation, um, this is how we represent the construction problem. We've got the clay on the bottom and we've got sand on top and the basement box. And one thing we observe is that the construction problem leads to this bob of excess pore pressure at the start of excavation. Um, and that bob becomes a bob of high volume change and also high effective stress change when the clay then consolidates to equilibrium. And now we can go back to the experimental results and compare the flexible and stiff basements. So the first thing I want to compare is the vertical movement. And the first thing to notice here is that the axes are actually different. If we have a flexible box, we get about six times as much displacement as the stiff box. Another thing to notice is that on the flexible box, it moves up a lot at the start, and then it continues to go upwards as the clay consolidates the equilibrium, whereas for a stiff box, it heaves upwards a lot 
well, not a lot, uh, um, a, a bit a bit more at the start. And then when we construct the basement structure by putting a load on top, it wants to settle back downwards and essentially stay there, which is somewhat curious. We see a very different behavior in the in-slab bending moments um, between the two models. So um, again, the axis is different um, because the flexible box is a lot more flexible. So it generates more movement, but retains a lot less bending moments inside a slab. One thing to notice here is that the curvature of this graph seems to go in the opposite direction between a stiff and a flexible boxes. And this is something we'll get back to later. But the important thing to notice at this point is that in the long-term equilibrium for the flexible box, the bending moment is essentially uniform, whereas for the stiff box, it's a sharp upward curve. Next, we'll look at um, the slab saw contact pressure. This time, I'll plot two different time stamps on the two different graphs and superpose the two basement models on top of each other. So at first excavation, we see that the flexible basement has basically lost all contact pressure. It just was completely relaxed. There wasn't very much restraint at all. While for the stiff basement, even on first excavation, when it was supposed to have least load, it still retains a, like 50 to 100 kPa um, because the slab was already there at the start of the experiment. Um, for reference, the pre-existing overburden stress is at about 240 kPa, so about here. That's 100% original overburden. In the long-term equilibrium, we see that the clay has regained some ground in the flexible structure, but the middle still essentially sees no force. While for a stiff basement, we see almost a uniform increase in pressure towards the middle um, up to about 160 kPa. So with that, we can postulate some mechanisms of heave. So what we think is that when we have a flexible box, it can move up a lot in the middle and so it essentially has complete realization of force in the middle span of the basement. And so when, when we analyze this concentrated load using elastic analysis, we get a distribution of bending moment that is essentially uniform, which is what we saw. For the stiff box, it can move only a little in total heave, and it can move even less in differential heave. So we expect the slab soil contact pressure under the, under the slab to remain somewhat uniform. And when we do an elastic analysis of that, we expect a parabolic distribution of bending moment, which is also what we see. And if we take the uniform bending moments in the flexible box and then do another elastic analysis on it, we expect a parabolic distribution of heave displacement, which is also similar to what we observed in the experiments. So now we can stick this back to the relaxation ratio method, the design prediction method that um, I was talking about. So the data for the stiff basement um, experiments are down here where they retain a significant proportion of the pre-existing load and have very little displacement. This confirmed that we do get about 60% of pre-existing overburdens turning up as heave load in the long term, but only if we build a typically stiff structure. If instead we use a flexible structure or otherwise let the slab heave a lot and release that movement, we get a lot of movement by design and a much lower stress. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we start designing a structure by assuming a heave load, that heave flow assumption will cause us to design a typically stiff structure. And that typically stiff structure to carry this load will in turn generate that load. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy that we need to break out of if we want to design linear basements. So to help us do that, I'm going to try to connect us back to the real world and think about the design considerations. The sharp-eyed ones among you will have noticed that 
my centrifuge models used a basement that didn't have anything below the bottom slab level. But in real life, we tend to build basements like this. We stick a wall into the ground first, and then we excavate down to formation level and then put a slab in. There is an extra bit of wall that is needed for the stability of the wall itself. So we wanted to do another experiment um, from uh, simulating this behavior. And so we did one with a fin extension that stuck three meters into the clay, which provided that extra embedment. Um, and it also um, created the tension embedment effect. We also did another one of stiff box and simply sunk it into the clay layer to see what effect we get by changing that groundwater um, regime at this interface because in our original experiments we had a layer of drainage of um, of dry of well, wet sand separating the clay from the basement to to speed up the experimental process. So here are the results. Um, when we embedded the stiff box into the clay layer, the bob of pressure, um, this is the finite element simulation, um, moved up towards the slab, but the displacements weren't affected very much. You can see that the difference here is only 10 millimeters. And those of you who have done construction projects will know that 10 millimeters is essentially um, the natural movements of a building due to um, due to seasonal and day and night temperature effects. So anything less than 10 millimeters, one can safely disregard in a real life construction problem. Whereas for the flexible basement, this, this embedment into the clay has cut off the groundwater and it had concentrated the deformation mechanism into the bit of clay just under the basement. And so the stiffness of the clay outside the box didn't contribute much to the overall mechanism of deformation. And that actually increased the overall movement slightly. Although one could also argue that this change is only a small proportion compared to the overall deformation. But the most significant effect we see here is that because these fins cut off the groundwater inside from the water outside, we get a much slower consolidation process. And so it's taking about one and a half times as much time for the groundwater to recharge and for the clay to get to 90% consolidation towards equilibrium. And because we've got finite element models, um, we decided to do an extra one um, only, only purely experimentally. And in this model, we excavated the basement space without the slab in place and then added a slab afterwards. So this allowed it to heave significantly in the short term before it put a structure in and then it heaved it a little bit more in the long term. Um, interestingly, the results have shown that the relaxation ratio method is actually able to capture this for as long as we have a good measurement of how much instantaneous deformation we get in the clay before we put the slab in. So um, to summarize these effects, um, we've seen from the embedment test that embedment itself actually has a very minimal effect on the movement and pressure that one sees due to heave. On the other hand, when we change, change the drainage condition, it has a huge effect on the rates of consolidation, and that is something to be aware of in construction. These hold, especially the minimal effect part, unless our construction method allows us to release the heave displacement and therefore relax the swirl pressure. And that's what we can take on to the final part of my talk, where I'll introduce improvements to the methods of prediction. So, We've been using this relaxation ratio method where we plot some measure of displacement versus some measure of pressure on the two axes and use the intersections as our, our, um, as our estimates of 
heave displacement and swell pressure. So can we put a bit more rigor to this? As far as I understand from our collaborators, in industry, we often assume that the load profile at the bottom of the slab is uniform. But our experiments have shown that actually that isn't the best assumption we can do. We can do slightly better than that by assuming a parabolic distribution. Because intuitively, if we have a slab that is allowed to move upwards, the ends of a slab will be held down the most. And so the ends should hold about the same amount of pressure as the pre-existing overburden, whereas the middle will relax to some lower value of pressure that is yet to be found out. So if we assume a parabolic distribution of pressure and, and plot that onto a graph, we can get a slightly less conservative but still applicable prediction line for our soil structure interaction behavior. And what we extract from this graph is now rigorously defined as the heave displacement and swirl pressure at the middle of the slab. And because in previous slides, we've seen that the heave displacement also seemed to follow a somewhat parabolic distribution, we can also fit a parabolic distribution on that as our first uh, approximation of displacement, or we can use the pressure simulation that we get from this and put it back into whatever structural model we are using to generate a structure curve to, to complete the set of predictions. So the other method we can use is to plot some non-dimensionalized measure of the stiffness of the slab on one axis and the proportion of pre-existing overburden that becomes long-term heat pressure on the other axis. And we've defined the, the relative stiffness um, parameter as such here. Intuitively, if we have a super flexible basement, we should expect that essentially no pressure is retained by the slab and it's just free to cave up as much as the soil wants to. So the curve starts from a very low number at the bottom near zero. On the other hand, if we have a super stiff basement, then we should expect the slab to retain 100% of the pre-existing overburden and just refuse to budge. And so the curve will end at a top asymptote of 100% pressure. And with the experimental and simulation data, we can now plot a, a best fit curve onto this. Um, I fitted an, a Gaussian error function of this as a first estimate. And the hope is that as both industry and, and academia generate more data um, in terms of long-term heave behavior, we can put more points on this graph and also refine the definition of the relative stiffness parameter so that we can use this curve to gain first order estimates of um, heave pressures to be used in design. So um, that's all I've got for you today. To sum up, in my research project, I performed eight centrifuge tests and corroborated that with site data and finite element simulations. And we found that the prediction of high slab soil contact pressure is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so to break out of that, we need to use a flexible structure and allow a high heave displacement so that we can release the heave pressures. And the data that we've generated in this project have been used to propose two improvements to existing semi-analytical design methods so that future engineers can build more economical um, designs of basements um, to help us fulfill the growing demand for underground space in the future. Okay, people are welcome to ask questions. I see Chris, uh, Professor Chris Burgoyne there. He used to set uh, exam questions for 1B people on uh, uh, underground slabs and the floors of swimming pools. So maybe Chris, do you have a, a, a comment to make? Uh, uh, yes, um, it's, it's interesting work. Um, uh, I'm thinking not so much of swimming pools where you might just have um, a bit of water on top. So a little bit of movement of the base doesn't matter. 
but in in normal circumstances um you have this basement with a building on top of it and so the issue very often for the building is going to be the difference between the uh, movement in the middle of the slab and the movement of the edge of the slab because that's going to cause uh, presumably differential vertical movement um, in the building that you're putting on top of this basement slab so um, uh, the idea of, of trying to use a very flexible basement so that you get rid of the pressure isn't necessarily the optimal solution because what you really want to do is get rid of the differential movement Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Burgoyne. I, I, I totally agree. And this isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. What we have investigated in this project is a range of stiffness and oversight loads that are possible and how each of these parameters affects the heave behavior. And so if we do want to restrain the movement completely, it's I think it's reasonable to build a heavy slab in that case. Alternatively, in industry, um, the method of allowing a suspended slab with a void former is also commonly used. So the slab is essentially built to be suspended from the side walls so that the clay could reclaim the space underneath the slab without pushing the slab up very much. Mm. And on the flexible end, we could also use that alongside internal fittings to create a, a false floor that is flat um, if there is desire from the occupant um, to, to do something like that. And I could see, for example, um, um, wine sellers and shopping mall sellers wanting this method of, of, of construction um, as an alternative that gives them a cheaper structure that they adjust for in occupation mm. yeah okay I, I i hear what you say i'm not sure i entirely agree with that but um uh, it's an interesting concept yeah thank you yeah. and uh, i can see adam uh, is there and Giovanna also attending, I think. Uh, either of you have a comment to make? Um, Derek, thank you. Um, I didn't, unfortunately, I couldn't, as I could, I couldn't join the beginning, but I certainly enjoyed uh, joining halfway through. So thank, thank you, uh, uh, Derek. I mean, I guess, yeah, yeah it, it comes back down to, um, uh, you, you know, I, I suppose, what's going through my mind is, is, is you know, how we use the information and, and, and what are the circumstances where we can get, get the benefit um, through uh, the, the, the flexible structure approach. Um, and I mean, have you had any assessment about what, what the sort of benefit impact might be to, to an overall um, basement um, if, if, if you did go the flexible approach? Have you done some initial numbers on that? Um, I I couldn't hear what type of basement you were referring to. Do you say rural or the flexible? Oh, flexible, right? So when we use a flexible basement, what we're saying is we allow more of that movement to take place, and so um, and we do that because we want to use less material. So I haven't run any like figures into it in terms of money, but we are talking about um, a reduction in stiffness and, and amounts of material um, of possibly um, one half or even two thirds if you want to allow that movement to happen. Um, and um, and, and of course, the flip side of that is you need to have your problem remain serviceable, your, your, occup your occupation of the building remain serviceable um, in that extra movement. Um, and um, another thing that may come into consideration is 
the drainage. So to get this um, release of, of pressure to work, one will likely need to also put in the drainage so that um, so that the groundwater recharge can happen. And also um, because the slab is much thinner, it will likely make sense to try to allow water to seep through and drain it like and, and dry up as as the water comes through rather than to try to make the slab 100 percent watertight like um for 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 all the use cases so so um there are these considerations to think of um one can say is essentially turning it from a capex problem to an opex problem um i think that is true although when one runs the life cycle numbers it's possible that there are a number of use cases where the flexible approach gives you a better performance overall despite requiring the drainage and 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 adjustment okay thank you though i think you know so i think that's that's almost a, a challenge back to, to us and maybe we can pick up um, out, outside this more specifically on, on, on the particular applications where there might maybe some benefit. But I think uh, it's a useful contribution uh, to helping us to think differently. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's another aspect to, to think about um, from the data here, which is that often um, different parties in a construction project disagree on what the prediction actually is and um and that is also a source of conservatism um because when you don't exactly know what the predicted amount of heave movement and swirl pressure should be then you automatically go for the most conservative interpretation of all your numbers and hopefully what i've done in the last few years is that i have furnish that discussion with more real data that um, um, the next people working on this can can use to calibrate whatever method they use in their design and and come up to a an an agreed um, design decision that is conservative because you need that structural and geotechnical performance rather than conservative because we don't know what is happening Absolutely. Okay. I see uh, Yu Sheng Su, who helped us a lot uh, in this whole project. Uh, do you have a comment about the numerical analysis uh, Derek has done? Hello? Hello, yeah. Sorry. Hello, Yushan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I think, uh, yeah. I, I think I think we went through quite a lot. Uh, I, I guess for the processes associated with the numerical modeling, I think I think Derek has has done quite a lot of work with, with Ringo as well. Where where we start off with understanding the the element testing and also calibrating the the nonlinear behavior of of a lot of the elements first before we jump into this particular problem here. I guess in real life the, the structure construction is, is quite uh, quite different because in this case you, you have more or less wish in place the, the structure into the ground. There's a lot of other effects when uh, when in real life where you have to like for example construct the wall uh, and also the excavation itself might 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 already have caused a lot of movement associated with the ground. No, but but I think I'm quite happy with what what has been done uh, and the processes that was taken to, to do the numerical modeling. Yeah, uh, one of the things I must say is that it would have been, um, one thing we uh, we had to go with the, uh, the joint between the walls and the slab being a welded joint in this case, which kind of uh, uh, didn't give us as much flexibility in terms of uh, um, having different wall stiffnesses versus uh, slab thicknesses, for example, or stiffnesses, I should say. Uh, that would be a, a nice addition to, to this work. But uh, the first point was the, to actually prove that we can get the uh, 
is swelling about right in the centrifuge and we can do it in a limited time and uh, there uh, derek was phenomenally successful i thought uh, when we compared what he measured in the centrifuge with the both the field cases as well as the your numerical analysis i think that's when we start to feel a bit more confident that this is the right way uh, or at least a nice way to uh, go and uh, model things in future okay are there any other questions derek uh, i have two questions happy okay go ahead great uh, thank you um so the, the one is uh, all regarding fp simulation so you know first one i just um, noted you use all tetrahedral elements isn't it so um, is there any purpose of using the tetrahedral elements uh, you know on your fe simulation and my second question is um so what is the material model you used on the the, the soil there you know when when you get the results yep um thank you kati um so most of my finite element simulations were done using were done in 2d using triangular models um that comes down to an earlier design decision which is we decided to use plexus as the simulation package so that the results can provide a direct link between the experimental output and how these kinds of basements are actually designed in industry and um and as far as i'm aware plexus currently only allows triangular elements um in this type of simulations we also performed um one set of 3d plexus simulation um courtesy again of um yushan and ringo um just to check the the um sensitivity to the 3d simplifying the 2d effect in that case we used um again um tetrahedral elements um because that is the the default and and the and the most tested and tried concept um in terms of the material for the clay we used small strain hardening model um and we calibrated the parameters using triaxial and one dimensional compression data on the same type of clay that are used in the experiments and for the dry sand um we used a more coulomb model using the same parameters as used by earlier work in scofield center cambridge um to compare the behavior of the same type of sand that are used um with finer element results yeah thank you for asking all right thanks okay are there any other questions and also thank you for um the the comments um from i think from vipul um thank you for stating that um is a 15 note triangular element and he commented that is very robust um and i should defer to him because he has definitely done more plexus than i have in my career <laughs> okay very good i think we shall draw this to a close uh, thanks again direct a uh, very well done job it's not easy uh, to keep going back and starting on slides uh, you coped phenomenally well i thought uh, uh, it, it was really impressive and you made all the concepts uh, uh, which are sometimes more intricate uh, than people would give credit for uh, very uh, clearly presented and overall uh, an excellent job i must say well done again this would normally be the time when we can all walk down to the uh, nearest pub and uh, uh, stimulate more discussions unfortunately we can't do that but uh, you're very welcome to uh, pick up a beer from your own fridge and have it on derek's count <laughs> yeah thank you very much and um i shall stop recording in a few seconds time thank you everybody again for coming um wherever on the world you are um thank you so much for supporting um me and my research and um yeah and um, thank you also to my wife in the next room who is helping to control this meeting and um to go power for introducing me and and um giving me such a stellar review of of, of my work with him
So thank you very much. And um, this room will stay open after I turn off recording and you're welcome to stay for a chat. Thank you. <laughs>